All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for coming out. It's uh, such a great to see so many people for so early. Uh, we've got a hot topic, so uh, it should be a good uh, way to wake you all up. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to quickly introduce everyone, and then we'll get started. Um, first, we've got Neria Aylward. She's a Master of Philosophy student in Development Studies at Oxford University. Uh, her current thesis project is critically examining the political myth of Muskrat Falls as seen by settlers to Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, next, we've got Steve Crocker, who is an associate professor at Sociology Department uh, and one of the organizers of this event. Uh, Dr. Crocker has written about the concept of the future in philosophy and social theory and about speed and contingency as political and cultural problems. Next, we have Jim Fian, uh, who is editor of the journal Newfoundland and Labrador Studies. In early 2012, way back then, uh, he published a C.D. Howe Institute policy brief, arguing that the Muskrat Falls project was inconsistent with economic principles. And finally, we have Dave Vardy, who is a founding member of the Muskrat Falls Coalition of Concerned Citizens. He served in a number of executive positions, including clerk of the Executive Council, president of Marine Institute, deputy minister of Finan fisheries, and chair of the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, so please give us them all a round of applause. And uh, we'll get started with Neria. All right, thank you so much, Carrie. Um, yeah. So, wait, let me make sure this is the right way. Here we go. Can you hear me, everyone? Okay, great. So, good morning, all. I won't try to speak any more Nuktatut because Angus taught me and he might be here and I don't want to embarrass him. Um, and my name is Naria Aylward. My family is from Gander and from St. John's. I grew up here in the city, but and also in Toronto. And I'm starting the second year of my master's in development studies at Oxford in the UK. And I know it's early and I know we're all tired. So I'm gonna make you folks do the work for the first few minutes of this presentation. So sorry about that. Um, can we switch back? Thanks. So this is the Ode to Labrador. If you're from Labrador, you probably know it. Um, if you're not, maybe you don't. Especially for the latter group, I'd just like everyone to take a few seconds to sing through these verses in your head or out loud or whatever floats your vote um, to the tune of O Christmas Tree, which I'm not making up. And then I'm gonna ask you some leading questions about it. So just take about a few seconds, just read through it, familiarize yourselves. So basically what I want to talk, what I just wanted to ask the people in the audience. So for people from Labrador, does this resonate with you? When, when did you first hear it? For people who aren't from Labrador, what does this make you think of? So can I have any volunteers? Anyone? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. And there, oh, <clears throat> I suppose people didn't hear me <laughs> very well in the back. I'm an Inuit uh, Bachelor of Education student, and um, in our uh, governance class and some other classes, actually, we did critically analyze Ode to Labrador. As a child growing up, I heard this song, and it just seemed normal at the time. So I was commenting that it was sort of part of our colonization. <laughs> in Labrador to, to think this is a, a good thing that our resources should be looked at this way. Um, so I just wanted to mention that, that we're, yeah, we're aware yeah. <laughs> of, of this. And of course, it wasn't written by, by someone from Labrador. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to kind of point out? Well, okay, let's move on, because we don't have that much time. But exactly that. And if we switch to the next slide. The first time I saw the Ode to Labrador as a Newfoundlander was when I went to do a tour at Churchill Falls, which I think is kind of telling, right? Um, to what, sorry, I missed your name. Tracy. To what Tracy was just saying. Um, and if you compare, compare it to the Ode to Newfoundland, right? 
in the Ojibwe Newfoundland, the country is still, it's wild, it's wilderness, but instead that makes us love it. And the winter is stern, but it's given the dignity of a proper name, an agency of its own. And most importantly, perhaps, those of us who can sing this song with pride are cast as the natural heirs to this land, passed down to us through patriarchal bloodlines from God knows how long. And if you were just to read through these anthems, you would imagine two very different places. They're two vastly different myths. And this is precisely what my research is about. For my master's research, I'm critically examining the, mem the memoirs of settler public figures in Newfoundland with a special fo focus on politicians. I want to understand how people with the platforms to shape public identity understand themselves and their place in the world. I've only just started my research, so this presentation is more about the thinking behind it. I do think, however, that this myth can be a useful lens to guide at least some of our discussion of politics and political economy in Newfoundland and Labrador in the age of Muskrat Falls. Um, so what do myths have to do with political economy, if anything? And I would argue everything because my master's depends on it. But first, <laughs> let's have a look at what political economy actually is. So this is how the Collins Dictionary defines political economy as the study of the way in which a government influences or organizes the nation's wealth. So this is a very, this kind of comes from Adam Smith, who wrote, was writing The Wealth of Nations in 1776. Um, it's this multi-volume treatise, for those of you who don't know, basically about how different countries end up with differing amounts of gold and silver, because with all their flaws, humans and institutions, especially governments, get involved with the functioning of the economy. So this is a really interesting insight, right? That wealth doesn't just generate itself, that people guide it. The economy doesn't run itself. And that's important. It can be a holistic way of examining the way that countries and their people do or don't make money in capitalist societies. And Smith would have called them commercial societies, but the point still stands. And it can teach us a lot about all the stupid mistakes, but also the bright ideas that governments and humans and institutions make that make their countries better or less well off. Can we just switch? Thank you. And this kind of analysis obviously has relevance for projects like Muskrat Falls. When you look at the conversation around Muskrat Falls, it's all pretty standard political economic analysis. So if we look, just look at the Muskrat Falls inquiry, just a little bit of it on, on the right-hand side here, the historical witness given by Jason Churchill just this week starts from 1949, from when Newfoundland, when it wasn't called Newfoundland and Labrador, became its own sovereign nation. And it talks about Muskrat Falls as a no negotiation between Hydro quebec and the government of Quebec, the government of Canada, and the Newfoundland and Labrador government and the different entities that have represented that over the years. It's looking at the ways that different interests have competed over the years to influencing the harnessing of the kind that we saw in the Ode to Labrador of the Churchill River. Or if we look at this newspaper article that just came out yesterday that I screenshotted from my iPad, really professional. Um, so Dwight Ball allegedly tears into Chess Crosby's and, and the PCs for what he calls the Great Mus Muskrat Seduction, which is kind of funny because in his own memoir, Chess Crosby's father, John Crosby, squarely places the, the blame on Joey Smallwood and the liberals for mismanaging the resource. A lot of political discourse surrounding Muskrat Falls has been politicians and bureaucrats pointing fingers at one another. Politicians, and that kind of speaks to the fact that politicians are often a lot more comfortable talking about one another than about a central assumption that underlies political economic analysis. Like the narrator of the Ode to Labrador, they all take for granted that the land belongs to them to begin with. It's a sovereign entity premised largely on ownership of land of the type that Adam Smith and many liberal political theorists envisioned and continue to envision today. So one thing that perpetually unsettles this comfortable conversation largely between old white guys is the persistence of indigenous people who are in surviving, thriving, and continuing to lay claim to their lands. It has taken Labradorians literally putting their body and safety on the line in protest to get politicians to listen up and include, however superficially, indigenous voices in this conversation. And I just want to clear up any misunderstanding. I don't think that any of this is necessarily wrong. I don't think that Jason Churchill is wrong. I don't think that Dwight Ball is wrong, even though I don't agree with him. Um, but I do think that our discourse is very limited. And it's only by virtue of the exceptional tenacity on the part largely of concerned Labradorians, but also just concerned citizens and journalists, that we've opened it up at all. So in this presentation, that's exactly what I want to talk about, how the political economy of Muskrat Falls is lacking a full reckoning with the legacy of empire and the shadows of ongoing colonialism. 
I'm going to talk about how muskrat falls and the settler political conversation around it is premised on entitlement to land that's not ours to begin with. So the research that I'm currently doing for my master's is about how settlers come to feel entitled, entitled to Labrador and continue to rationalize that ownership. And I'd just like to point out that this is by no means a groundbreaking idea. Um, I think that for most people in this room, this is pretty old news. And for indigenous people, it's an everyday lived experience. But for all kinds of reasons, this glaring insight has failed to make any lasting marks on the way that we talk about muskrat falls and about politics in Newfoundland and Labrador generally. I think that it's a responsibility on the part of settler scholars like myself to turn a critical lens on settler mythologies. So I want to make a I want to make the point that a really critical examination of Muskrat Falls requires that settlers stop pointing fingers at one another just for a second and confront the racialized mythology of entitlement that keeps settlers in positions of power in this province in the first place. We need to, oh, thanks. <laughs> we need to ask ourselves how we even got to the point where the Muskrat Falls in inquiry is not entirely about colonialism and white supremacy. So please switch sides. So settler, settler myths start with settlement. And one story of settlement in Labrador is that of the British Empire. And thinking through the lens of colonialism reminds us that the political economy of Muskrat Falls is not just a local, provincial, or even national story. In the same year that the Ode to Labrador was written by an Oxford-educated Englishman who went to this place, which is down the road from where I go to school, it's funded by blood diamonds from Cecil Rhodes. Um, Dr. Henry, Labrador was given to Newfoundland in, by the Judicial Court of the Privy Council, which is the highest court in the British Empire. In order to decide that Labrador should belong to Newfoundland rather than to Canada, they drew on cases from the Gold Coast in what we would now call Ghana and the Coromandel Coast in India. Labrador was understood as a British col colony, just like the other, in an empire where, on which the sun never set. What was at stake in this decision was control over resources, and more specifically control over the Churchill River Basin. Since well before the PCs and the Liberals and Dwight Ball and Chess Crosby even existed, settlers were arguing over who got to dam the river, and it, is ne and it was never Indigenous people. And while empire dictates that Indigenous people, and here I mean Indigenous in the more kind of global generalist sense, were never given the chance to dam the river, should they have ever wanted to, by way of sovereignty, they also faced the greatest burdens of environmental destruction. This phenomenon is called environmental discrimination, which Taylor defines as follows in her excellent book, Toxic Communities. So environmental discrimination is the processes that result in minority and low-income communities facing disproportionate environmental harms and limited environmental benefits. In, in The Wrong Complexion for Protection, Bullard and Wright go on to write, environmental and public health threats from natural and human-made disasters are not randomly distributed. Healthy places and healthy people are highly correlated. It should be as no surprise that the poorest of the poor within United, the United States and around the world have the worst health and live in the most degraded and at-risk environments. And obviously, when you think about it, the burdens of mega projects like Muskrat Falls fall disproportionately on poor people and people of color. Think of the Kinder Morgan pipeline, hydro development in Manitoba, and also in Taylor's writing about African Americans in the US, others have written about poor people in Appalachia in the, in the US. But taking this broad view reminds us that it's not just about Chess Crosby and Dwight Ball or whoever's in power. It's about these bigger structures. But now we have to think about how that actually happens. And many people have argued, argued that settler colonialism requires this exact relationship between settlers, indigenous people, and land in order for the nation to exist. This has important implications for political economy that environmental racism is a permanent relationship rather than some unfortunate accident. As Boyles writes in Waste Landing, Legacies of Uranium Mining in Navajo Country, thank you. settler colonialism is a distinct form of colonial power with a very particular relationship to resources and land. It's a form of colonial power that involves the settler making a home in a land that is already home to indigenous people. To quote Deborah Bird Rose, indigenous peoples got in the way of settler colonialism just by staying at home, because home is precisely what the settler colonial state seeks to occupy and remake. Remaking native land as a settler home involves the exploitation of environmental resources, to be sure, but it also involves a deeply complex construction that, the, that of land is either already belonging to the settler, his manifest destiny, or is undesirable, unproductive, or unappealing, in short, as the wasteland. 
Settler colonialism requires a twin myth, that indigenous people are irrelevant and that their land are therefore free for, is therefore free for the taking, or that their land is worthless and pollutable with leaked oil from pipelines or methylmercury from flooded debris. This corresponds really well with the experience that Lisa related yesterday in her address. In school, settler children in Newfoundland learn that indigenous people in Newfoundland and Labrador are either extinct or that they can't govern themselves. In either case, settlers learn to inherit the land from a young age. This myth is of unadulterated whiteness is the same one that I catch myself reproducing when I tell people at school that everyone in Newfoundland is white, despite the fact that my own mother, a woman visibly of color whose own mother immigrated from India, grew up her whole life in Gander. And so this myth perpetuates itself through residential schools and environmental violence and other fines, forms of genocide, cultural or otherwise. As Franz Fanon, a psychiatrist, philosopher, and revolutionary from the then French colony of Martinique wrote, the cause is the consequence. You are rich because you are white. You are white because you are rich. It is a double bind that allows the settler to inherit the earth and as such allows political economy to make sense. Indeed, as Voiles continues, slide. Native encounters with settler colonialism are so deeply entangled with environment and resources that even the phrase environmental racism can seem to lose all meaning in a tribal context, quite simply because racism has always meant environmental violence for native peoples. Nationhood requires exclusion, and at its core, the settler colonial nation requires violence to survive. Violence against land, people, and all their relations. Newfoundland and Labrador was born on original sin, theft at best, genocide at worst. Political economy is well and good, but we need to start our analysis at least in 1492, when Columbus did or didn't sail the ocean blue, but never in 1949. 1949 is much too late, because although they may be its worthy heirs, it's presumptuous to think, even for a second, that the PCs or the liberals invented colonial violence. As Valerie Kulets writes in The Tainted Landscape, Environmental Ruin in the American West, about the dumping of nuclear waste on indigenous land during the Cold War. Once revealed, the nuclear landscape can be perceived and experienced differently. It can be seen as one landscape imposed upon another, a landscape of national sacrifice, as ex an expendable landscape over which many North American Indians understand as a geography over the, of the sacred, a geography where spiritual and cultural life are woven directly onto the landscape itself. What Valerie Kula says so succinctly is that the nation state requires sacrifice, and this sacrifice is often made under threat. Threats of climate change that only clean hydropower from Labrador can save us from. Threats to the dignity of Newfoundlanders who got played and embarrassed by Quebec in the Churchill Falls seal. It's easy to see these threats as politicized myths, but we have to remember that in the face of threat to the nation, someone has to make a sacrifice and that that sacrifice is often pushed onto native people and their worthless land. That myths of Newfoundland pride, identity, or of energy security even, have other characters. There's nothing inherently just about a democracy because all nations are built on these myths. And the settler myth requires death of people, of cultures, of different stories and bodies to survive. And so I end by, with another quote by Fanon which at the same time offers a seemingly insurmountable obstacle, but at this also a radical glimmering hope for a new kind of political economy. Decolonization, which sets out to change the order of the world, is obviously a program of complete disorder. Thank you. My road crew is not with me. I have to do this on my own. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. I'm Steve Crocker from the sociology department. Can you hear me? Yeah? Uh, here? Hi, everyone. I'm Steve Crocker. You never know what distance to get too close, too far away. Here? Yeah? Uh, I'm Steve Crocker from the sociology department, which I'm sure you're aware of now. Uh, I uh, would like to make a contribution to what you might call the sociology of financing of Muskrat Falls. Uh, I would consider it to be kind of political economy. I, I liked uh, Nira's uh, description of that from Adam Smith, that the economy doesn't work on its own, but needs to be guided and, and organized by human agency. 
I think that's true and that that theme comes up in the discussion of Muskrat Falls in very important and interesting ways. That at the center of Muskrat Falls is an incomprehensible contradiction that a $13 billion investment in energy security will result in less accessible energy for people. That a doubling of electrical rates will mean a halving of the access to electricity for folks. How can this be that a $13 billion investment leads to less energy security? It would be as if you renovated your home, but it made it less livable. You went to the garage and got your car fixed, but it was less drivable. How does this organization happen? So there are different explanations of it in circulation that it is inherently incomprehensible simply because the project is so large that an element of chaos accompanies it that is beyond our capacity to understand and all we can do is stand out of its way and let it work itself out. I'm overstating things that are subtler, but you get the idea. That is one. Um, another is that um, it just can't, it's, it, it can't be understood because that's just the way it goes with mega projects is a common thing as well, that it has its own kind of logic about it. Uh, is it corruption? Is it a kind of crime? This is something you often hear in public meetings and, and in the press that, that there are criminal activities here and people should be rounded up and charges pressed and so on. But as I'll try to m explain to you, it may be even more disturbing that a crime has not been committed and that the contradiction is legally organized. And that's what I want to try to get at, what the actual legal and political organization of the financing is, the kernel of rationality at the center of all of the chaos that spins out from it. I think if we give up on thinking that that is comprehensible, we will never be able to respond to it. One other explanation that I meant to mention that is in circulation are psychological ones. Cognitive bias or, or optimism bias are ultimately reducing that down to the psychological properties of the people who are making the decisions. And that tells us nothing about the social and political organizations and actual binding relations that hold people to account for a loan that they never signed up for and that undermines their energy security. So we need to understand the comprehensible part of Muskrat Falls in order to understand how it produces the incomprehensible chaos that it's visiting upon us. And I'd just like to make a small contribution to understanding that comprehensibility or to keep on course our thinking of it. So now I'll read a paper. I'll try to be brief. <clears throat> In the best, most optimistic scenario, Muskrat Falls was going to redeem the lost honor of Churchill Falls and ring in the new millennium with a whole new approach to financial and energy security. When Kathy Dunderdale removed the project from the public oversight of the Public Utilities Board, she said it was about much more than utilities. It was about economic development and a new vision for the province. In the most generous interpretation of its history, the vision was to provide a reliable source of clean energy and a constant stream of revenue for the province into the 21st century. The Williams and Dunderdale government's new energy campaign aimed to roll our surplus oil revenue into a green future of clean hydropower. The massive scale of this dam, 4.9 terawatt hours of energy, almost four times more than the province would likely need to meet its future energy requirements, and 1,200 miles of transmission cables, was justified by a poorly researched plan to sell excess energy over the maritime link to Nova Scotia and on the American on-the-spot market. Long-term revenue from external sales would eventually cover the short-term mega costs of its construction. In this way, it promised a unity of financial and energy security. Muskrat Falls came into being with much fanfare about its technical and financial wizardry. It was supposed to be an equally stunning political coup that would reestablish Newfoundland's place in the Canadian Dominion. Building for massive capacity and selling excess power on external markets would make our domestic energy cheap and secure. That was the idea. The project was planned and organized by NALCOR, the provincial government's newly founded energy corporation. NALCOR was the recreation of the crown corporation NALCO. In its new form, it had much greater commercial privileges. It did not have to tender bids for contracts to disclose details of contract disputes and payments. It was allowed to shield corporate information from the public. Even now, as it testifies at a public inquiry on the Muskrat Falls project, it does not have to disclose its commercial dealings to the public. Though it operated public utilities, it was not accountable to the Public Utilities Board. Through these privileges, it ultimately did not have to demonstrate the need 
for the utilities it now planned. And though it was supposedly run more like a commercial enterprise than a crowned corporation, it was unlike any other commercial enterprise is because it did not have to show that there was a demand or external, a local demand or external commercial market for its power, or it didn't have to show in a rigorous way at least, only that there was a way to finance the building of the generation and transmission infrastructure. Unlike other commercial enterprises, it had access to the state's assistance for creating conditions for project completion in everything from control of public dissent, regulation of environmental review, responsibility for public health, questions of sovereignty, legal control of resources to, crucial in this, way, in, in this case, authority to regulate consumer energy revenue and to securitize finance. Nalcor was released from the competitive constraints of the market, but also from the regulations of public oversight that up to now guided our utilities. Because the project never ever made business sense, never had to make business sense, we might say, from the start, it has required all it could drain from the province's financial resources, along with the full weight of legislative power to force its ill-conceived supply-side economics into existence. Nalcor is now a monstrous problem child of state monopoly regulation in the service of wild market speculation, the worst of both worlds. In the name of more robust energy, it has taken as equity $2 billion from provincial revenue and borrowed $8 billion capital, 7.9, that it has amortized deep into the future and which will result in inaccessibly high electrical rates for most of the 21st century. To make what little market there is for the dam's, to, to maintain what little market there is for the dam's excess power, the project has been accompanied by legislative prohibition on the sale of other sources of energy that might provide citizens a reasonable alternative to expensive muskrat hydro. In a complex arrangement, which I'll explain more in a moment, financing for the project has required that the power of the legislature, has required the power of the legislature to turn government regulated consumer electrical bills into a collateralized security, the same sort of securitized debt obligation behind the 2008 financial crisis. On the basis of this secured revenue flow of what consumers can be collectively made to pay on their monthly electrical bills for the rest of the century, the province has borrowed a massive $7.9 billion loan to secure the capital to construct a hydroelectric dam and energy grid that has been built at such a disproportionate size to our needs, at least four times greater than we need, that the cost of its construction and operation will more than double the price of electricity. The new energy plan will place energy security outside the reach of those with lower or little income and ultimately make our energy and financial security far more dependent on markets and factors outside our control. As many critics, even Nalcor CEO Stan Marshall have pointed out, it is doubtful that the business plan of selling excess power over the maritime link will ever be a reliable source of revenue. As Marshall says, it was a gamble and we lost. The problem we now face, though, is that even though we know it will not work, that, it, that we lost, and that there is no market, it is being forced into existence anyway, in spite of its illogic and obvious health risks. It is therefore an excellent example of what Marx called alienation. Our collective wealth appears to us now as an alien, hostile, independent power that threatens our financial, physical, and energy security. Nonetheless, even though it is now hostile and opposed to our interests, we have to serve it. It must be completed. The project has taken on a pathological life of its own and is now like a cancerous growth that lives off the life around it, which it displaces and makes increasingly impossible as it advances toward completion. When it comes online, the dam's financing and operation costs, these numbers I take from David Vardy's excellent analysis, it compares Muskrat Falls and the Site C Dam in BC, which is a fantastic document about Muskrat Falls, so, when it comes online, the dam's financing and operation costs alone will amount to $1.5 billion a year, which Nalcor will have to acquire from ratepayers. Annual payments for the dam will be more than the total provincial education budget and half the health budget. Operational costs and loan payments will absorb any capital that would otherwise be available to the public good to mitigate uh, rates for those most affected. We can already feel the gravitational pull of this black hole of debt sucking our collective future into a cold oblivion. A likely worst case scenario is that increased prices will drive down demand and within a decade, Nalcor will be unable to collect the $1.5 billion revenue to make payments. 
In that case, the federal government, the guarantor of the loan financing the project, will be forced to pay the bank and will be in a position to negotiate the ownership of the dam or assets equivalent to its value, such as offshore oil revenue and equity in the most more fiscally viable Churchill Falls Dam and all its profitable infrastructure. Muskrat Falls is a clear and present danger to the people of the province. To understand how it has been visited upon us and what we are up against, it is important to locate its place in larger politico-economic changes, in particular, the rearranging of social life around new techniques of debt financing and the transformation of public resources into securitized assets for capital loans. Debt financed capital intensive projects like this inject massive hits of wealth into circulation, but the actual act infrastructure and wages that it provides need not have any public utility at all and yet still work as reliable investment vehicles. And that is really the contradiction of how you get to a $13 billion investment not providing energy security. The failure of this project to provide a demonstrable measure of public good in spite of the enormous cost to public health, finance, and democracy seems to defy all common sense. It also offers an important opportunity for a kind of forensic sociology that sees in the cracks and fissures of this broken mega project an opportunity to understand the means and mechanisms through which the basic elements of our polity, such as sovereignty, public health, social welfare, democratic oversight of public finance, are being reorganized in new ways uh, that will be difficult to undo and that will threaten the most basic kinds of collective security we will need to provide to each other in an increasingly insecure world. But to understand how Muskrat Falls is changing our relations to one another and where the chaos comes from, we need to recognize the comprehensible kernel of planned rationality at the center of the unplanned chaos that is visited upon us now. As a public inquiry gets underway, as I mentioned at the beginning, the theme of incomprehensibility is already in the air. The project rests, so the kernel of comprehensibility, the project rests ultimately on the legislative power of the state to continue to fuel the failed speculation by their own admission with the security that it has extracted from us, the people. And that has required more than optimism or cognitive bias. It required a significant amount of forethought and sober cognition to arrange things so that Muskrat Falls remains in an economic investment, the less secure we be, that Muskrat Falls remains as an economic investment, even though we can become less secure as a population in need of heat, food, and security. At a number of public meetings I have attended, Concerned citizens have wondered whether the financial disaster of Muskrat Falls is in fact a kind of organized crime, which should be pursued through legal channels. In many ways, though, the situation is worse, since organized crime always supposes a world in which one can appeal to a counterforce of rule and law. What is most threatening about Muskrat Falls is that the boondoggle is based on sophisticated mechanisms that have legally removed the project from public oversight and control, and most importantly, from any requirement to serve the public good. What will make our lives increasingly difficult are the fail-safe mechanisms that guarantee that no matter what new problems might emerge, the first legal responsibility of our collective resources and infrastructure is to serve the purpose of debt financing for most of the rest of the century. Whether or not that results in energy security or public health is now officially a secondary consideration. To ensure its reliability for investors, the Dunderdale government used the state's legislative power to enforce unregulated rate increases on domestic, on domestic customers, specifically to limit oversight of the utility and to restrict the development of alternative energy development, or rather buy specifically those things. In 2012, coming toward the end here now, in 2012, these changes were explicitly justified on the basis that they would provide banks and lenders enough confidence to advance credit for construction. In 2012, Natural Resource Minister Jerome Kennedy made this purpose clear when he explained, quote, it will be necessary to show lenders, and it has been necessary to show lenders and rating agencies that the rates charged to the ratepayers will be sufficient to cover the costs of the generation and transmission of Muskrat Falls power, and that the rate obtained from that the revenue obtained from the rates will flow unfettered. This is, in effect, the explanation of the legislation, which unhinged the project from the goal of energy security 
and reconceived our regulated electrical rates as a flow of collateralized payments for a massive loan for a machine that ultimately undermines energy security. What it reveals is that, as comical as it may seem, to this author at least, when the project had been subjected to the highest levels of financial scrutiny, the only actually reliable future source of revenue on which a schedule of loan payments could be based was the predictable regularity of customers on the island paying their regulated electrical bills on time rather than any demonstrable external demand that would justify the massive generation and transmission capacity. That is why it was necessary that the rates charged to the ratepayers will be sufficient to cover the cost of the generation and transmission of muskrat power because there was no other revenue ever to come from it. Bill 61 ensures that as the project goes off the rails, it crashes into an environment already set up for it to continue to succeed as a return on investment, even if it does not provide access to energy or public health in return. In other words, unfettering the flow of our electrical rates to finance the dam introduced a reversal of means and ends, whereby the imposition of any measure of public utility or safety could now be recast as an obstacle to the financing of an energy investment vehicle that might not ever serve the public good. That's just the way it goes with mega projects, but that is a pretty precise and calculated way that it goes. Muskrat Falls is the child of finance capitalism. It was built because it could be securely financed through techniques like collateralization and not because its generation and transmission capacities were ever needed. Its Byzantine legal and financial techniques, David Barty's excellent phrase, is a kind of dam against every other social responsibility we might face which channels the force of our collective resources and energy imagination into the strictures of reliable reimbursement for a device that diminishes energy security. This unlivable situation in which a near $13 billion investment in energy security can result in less heat and energy security is not due to any crime. It is due to the strategic use of very precise financial and legal mechanisms. As McKeith asks in Three Penny Opera, what's robbing a bank compared to founding one? Okay, good morning. Um, I'm an economist, and of course, I'm inclined, therefore, to look at the economics of this project. And most of what I'll talk about will be the bas basic economics and how I came over time to realize that they're really quite, in my view, quite flawed. Um, and essentially, I call this investment saw economics, right? It's, it's really not much economics in the justification for this uh, Muskrat Falls project. There's business plans based upon monopolization of the market, which, which Steve already talked about, with this sort of iron grip monopoly to force people to pay. But if that weren't in place, this just wouldn't make any commercial sense. Uh, given that it's in place, it doesn't make any economic sense. Um, I think it's important though, while I, I will focus on the costs and the economics of this project, it's important to note that economics is, an, is a significant dimension in the whole process here and in, in our future in terms of what's going to happen. But there's many other dimensions that other people with more knowledge uh, than me can talk about. There's the community concerns. There's the localized environmental impacts. There's a question of corporate governance. How was Nalcor governed and Hydro governed and how do they have those interlocking uh, or overlapping boards? The lack of separation of Nalcor and its boards from government. Uh, how close were they? Why didn't they have more uh, stronger independent mandates? What was the decision-making process and all the things that happened leading up to the Muskrat Falls uh, decision? What about the role of journalism and, and public information in Newfoundland? There's so many dimensions to this project and uh, none of them I think are sort of happy stories. Uh, but let me move on to what I know a little bit more about which is the economics of the project. 
Uh, first of all, we can just click through them all, I guess, Gary. Um, I've been looking at hydro-related issues in this province for quite some time. Before I looked at Muskrat Falls, I'd published a number of things on the Churchill Falls contract and what happened there. And one thing I remember, uh, not, not that it was my observation, but it came from um, Philip Smith's book about Brinko. Um, the leadership of Brinko at the time when they were doing Churchill Falls, yeah, at one time he described it as such, particularly the, the key decision-making person at the time, he said they had the attitude of damned torpedoes full speed ahead. And of course, there we go. We had Churchill Falls and all the uh, negative aspects of Churchill Falls that we've lived with ever since. So I figured, oh, well, we've learned from that. We'd never do that again. Well, here we are. We uh, didn't care about the torpedoes this time around either. It had to be done. And what I've done, I've looked at a number of aspects of uh, Muskrat Falls uh, over the past number of years, really from almost the beginning of the proposal, which I was neither for or against when it first started, but I you know, wanted to see the numbers, wanted to assess what was going on, whether it made sense. And, but fairly early on, I realized it didn't really seem to pass the basic economics test, the economics level, you know, second or third year economics I would teach. I was thinking, this doesn't really make sense. Maybe there's something else there. And I've been looking at it ever since. You look through these, these, these various contributions. Um, I've come to more and more try to understand what's going on. And every time I try to understand it, it makes less and less sense. The economics, in my opinion, just were never there. So let's just go on maybe to the next so slide and, and maybe set up some basic economics here. Uh, looking at modern utility economics. Th there, there is a set of knowledge. There is, uh, you know, Dave Vardy, of course, being former chair of the PUB, would know much of this or more than me. But there is a vast body of a discipline within economics that looks at managing public utilities. And very much the traditional approach was to have monopolized public utilities like electricity producers where the price was based on average cost and the rate of return was kept at some sort of acceptable le level that was determined by the regulatory process. But economists have always had some trouble with this, arguing that what we really need from public utilities is, is to achieve economic efficiency. And price shouldn't be just the outcome of cost. It should be an important ingredient into controlling demand and contributing to the efficient use of resources. And I won't get into the economics, but basically it says price should be according to marginal cost. The price you pay should reflect the actual cost of resources, capital, environmental use of generating the last unit of electricity. And this became... Uh, initially, it was considered sort of a theoretical possibility, but it became more uh, seen to be implementable uh, beginning in the post-war period in France. Then we had economists, a uh, crucial contribution was the marginal cost pricing and social investment criteria for um, electricity undertakings. So that was sort of the basic e economics articles like that were saying, this is how you do it. There's an interaction between your in social investment in e uh, electricity infrastructure and pricing. And that sort of drove the shift in the United States to um, FERC, its regulatory agency, to try to make wholesale markets more competitive with the idea of being, bringing electricity prices in, out that were consistent with marginal cost. And of course, even more recently, there's been the economics of greenhouse gases and a recognition that as long as electricity is generated from sources that use fossil fuels, then there should be a carbon tax associated with the actual burning of those fuels. Now, if we go on to the next slide, where were we pre-Muskrat Falls? We weren't doing marginal cost pricing, which actually would have meant higher prices. So that, of course, led to me being criticized for my suggestion on that. But well, what are we facing now? You know, uh, I was talking about, you know, maybe a couple of cents more per kilowatt hour. Now we're talking double. Now we're talking 23 cents, which is, by the way, just a signal that the project is uneconomic because if the price you need for it to be commercial is so high that people won't pay that price, then that tells you that was not the project to do. Um, 
So we were in a situation where our problem was Holyrood. Holyrood was the marginal supplier. It was very costly because of the fuel costs to produce electricity from that plant. In addition to that, there was the greenhouse gas element, which meant that the price actually should have been more than the fuel cost price because it should reflect the um, greenhouse gas and other emissions from the plant. That held down, the, the, the whole process held down the price of electricity relative to fuel. It's odd. Fuel was going up, but the price from Holyrood was not going up because it was being held down. So what do people with furnaces do? They shift to electric heat. And so instead of a 50-50 split, over time what we had was an ongoing shift of people installing electric heat because the price signal they gave was the wrong price signal. The price signal they were given was the wrong signal. And people will naturally respond to prices when they're installing heat in their houses and they're going to try and get the best deal they can for themselves. So now we had the complication of more electric heat. And in the wintertime, people turn their heat up. So we have a peaking problem puts more stress on the Holyrood plant. We did had some relief because the paper mills closed and that took some of the base load away. But we, and Holyrood, reliance on Holyrood did go down from the peak years, but we still were left with an old plant. Our problem was we didn't have a carbon tax. We had an old plant. Our, pro, our, our solution should have been to deal with that. But we took a, apparently a shotgun approach based upon somehow getting even with Quebec or something. And we ended up with Muskrat Falls assessment being done by, um, the next one, being done by Nalcor. Nalcor, of course, had the energy plan or the provincial government, which was largely, I guess, driven by Nalcor, um, even though they may not have called it Nalcor at the time. Um, the energy plan said, let's do Gull Island. And of course, as always, Muskrat Falls was sort of an add-on because it had never been ever suggested, I think, before then that Muskrat Falls by itself was an economically viable uh, project. Now, we had the Joint Federal Provincial Environmental Assessment Panel that looked at that. It went through a lot of um, hearings, hearings uh, in, the, uh, in Labrador and, and elsewhere. They heard the community concerns. And that, uh, that panel, finally, when it reported, listed many concerns that it had, environmental, community, and otherwise. But it also said it was, it was quite critical that the project of the project itself, saying it wasn't, it wasn't convinced, at least the evidence wasn't presented, that this project was even in the lo long-term financial interest of the province. Then we had the government saying, well, we're doing it anyway. And we had it, we had it go to the PUB, but in a very narrow sense, uh, not a general assessment as it would be with a normal project. It was just this isolated island option versus uh, Muskrat Falls. And even then, the PUB, in that limited scope and without the time it required or asked for, was said it couldn't say which one was the lower cost option. So despite that, two disinterested parties with some expertise looking at it and saying, oh, we're not so sure about this, the government decided to go ahead. And the federal government joined in, gave the loan guarantee. And I think that probably was pivotal. I don't know that they would have actually been able to do it without the federal loan guarantee. And then the government, of course, po imposes all sorts of anti-competition uh, legislation to ensure that, again, as Steve pointed out, ratepayers would pay. They couldn't flee. They, with the link to Nova Scotia, we couldn't import cheaper power. No, we had to buy it. And we couldn't even, if we were in the land industry, we couldn't self-generate. That was banned as well. And so what we had was um, a situation in which the government was pushing this project. And at sanction, we saw it cost about 7.4 billion. And we were going to get about a little less than 4 million megawatt hours a year annually, because a chunk of that power would have to go to EMIRA for the maritime link. So we had a lot of issues here. Uh, one thing, I guess, to back up a little bit in this slide, when we saw that, you know, same slide, uh, when we look at Na uh, Nalcor's submission to the PUB, they also, it, it's interesting how they compared things in terms of the alternative. At that time, the project was $6.2 billion. Um, it was a very limited comparison, but also all the comparisons in the sensitivity analysis were peer-wide. So you compare Muskrat Falls to wind. 
you would compare and, and say, okay, muskrat wins based upon their numbers. You compare muskrat falls to conservation, muskrat falls wins. But at no point was it comparing muskrat falls to an integrated plan of conservation, proper pricing, and win. And of course, if you play with the numbers and look at the numbers they presented, if you did an integrated approach, you wouldn't be too difficult to come up with something that would be better, even within that limited framework. So what do we end up with? Well, the next slide, I guess, is where we ended up with. We ended up with um, the announcement of the project, the first line there, we have $6.2 billion project. By the time it goes to the PUB, the project in total, the third column over, 7.4 billion. So the PUB assessed it at 6.2 and said, now we're not sure that that's the lowest cost option. By the time they're sanctioned, the thing is already 20% more and shovels haven't gone into the ground. Then we get the progression over time. 2014, it goes to 8.3, then it's 8.9. Then it becomes, in 2016, it's up to 11.4 billion. Stan Marshall has just taken over around that time. And not only is it 11.4 billion in cost, the whole Astaldi fiasco is really up in the air. That's another billion dollar problem. So once that's sorted out, we see that Stan Marshall basically uh, inherited a $12.7 billion burden. Not the original 6.2, but 12.7 billion. Been able to hold it so far at that level. But you're very deep in the hole at $12.7 billion. And of course, the schedule's delayed. So now we're in a, approaching the post um, Muskrat Fall era. We're stuck with a project. You can't go back, can't get your money back. It's going to be an ongoing burden. The loan guarantee agreement says that ratepayers must pay. It's really interesting here what happened. The federal government loan guarantee is in place, but as part of that, as an addendum to it, the province agrees that this project will be paid for by ratepayers. So unless that changes, unless there's some amendment, that's where the 23 cents or so comes from that Stan Marshall's announced. That is the framework that's in place. If there's no change, this is sort of automatic. But at 23 cents, who can afford electricity? You'll be driving people to oil, furnaces, uh, mini splits, drive some businesses, I guess, out of business. That 23 cents is not really a sustainable price. So the government's talking, and now, of course, talking about price mitigation. Now, remember, this is the price at which the project is supposed to generate its return and its profit. So as soon as you mitigate the price, you're admitting the project's a loser. Okay? It's not a good investment. Um, Still, we don't have any economics involved in terms of pricing. What's the price going to be? And numbers are picked out of the ear. Sometimes people say, well, it shouldn't be any higher than Nova Scotia, but they're, different. they're in a different situation. We have to price it according to basic economic principles. No real talk of that yet, although it's early and maybe that will uh, influence things. So then the question becomes, what's the efficient price? Before, when electricity was scarce and the marginal supplier was an expensive plant that should have had a carbon tax on it and, and should have um, been the rationale for higher pricing, we're now going to be in a situation where we're going to have all this extra electricity. So we had a shortage before of costly, and it was costly, and we were keeping the price down. Now we're talking about a situation where the supplies increase greatly, a massive amount of electricity will come from that plant, and we're talking about raising the price. It's like a bizarro world when it, when it comes to the economics of it. The efficient price is probably a price around what it is today or lower. But of course, the problem with that is then who and how do you pay for this $12.7 billion project plus the ongoing operating costs that we'll see. So the real problem we face now, given that the project has happened, is how to pay for it and who pays. It's a difficult question of political economy, I guess we would say. Just, so just to conclude, what we have was government and now court ignoring or dismissing warning signs and advice of unconflicted experts. We had the joint panel, the PUB, and various individuals talking about the economics of it. 
They even, had, and this is, I think, a big issue that will come up. They even uh, ignored the advice of SNC Lavalin, and I guess it was 2013, and we only found out about it last year that Lavalin said, "Hey, this this project is riskier than than you think." And then we initially thought it could be billions of dollars more in cost. That was the report that apparently nobody saw, even though the cover of it says for the client Newfoundland Hydro or Nalcor, whatever it says on the on the cover. So. All the people who talked about the economics of it, who were unconflicted, said there's a problem. Now, of course, we have other experts. We have environmental experts. We have experts to do with the, um, the North Spur. Uh, there's a lot of other dimensions to this, as I said at the beginning. But even in terms of the pure economics, there, was, there were issues with this. So this, I see, is not a project where it's a conflict between environmental and community concerns on one hand, and economics on the other hand. This is, no, they're both on the same size, the side in this case. And if we had had an assessment that included efficient pricing and integrated alternatives, I don't think this project would have gone anywhere. That's why they weren't considered, I suspect. If someone wants to you know, damn the torpedoes and go, go full speed ahead. So again, the future is getting the price right and bearing the burden. It's not gonna be a happy future as far as this project is concerned. Sorry, I can't end on a happier note. Thank you. All right, next up we got Dave Vardy. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I've been involved with this project for so long that people have been imploring that I write a book on the subject and my response up to now and hasn't changed is I like stories with happy endings, and this is not one of them. And what I'm going to be saying to you this morning is going to be uh, very much reinforcing what uh, my predecessors have said, uh, my colleagues at the table have said um, about the project, and it very much ties in with what I'm going to talk about. I wanted to congratulate the organizers of this event. I think they've done a great job. And at one point, I called Steve Crocker, and I said, Steve, you know, you really need to get the artistic and cultural community involved in this thing. He said, I'm ahead of you. I got that done. So, and I thought last night was marvelous. I thought it was really great to have the artists and community in, in our community, because what we need is a holistic approach to this project. We don't, we don't want to focus all on the economics and the finance. We need to look at the impact on the people. We need to look at the impact on the environment. Now, I'm going to be talking today about uh, essentially a similar uh, line of thought as Jim has, has given you. And I'm going to be talking, to, I'm going to pose some questions and I'm going to deal with those questions. And, what, and I've got a lot of stuff here. I'm going to go through these slides fairly quickly. So, and Kerry, I'm going to give Kerry a signal when I want to move to the next slide. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge that I've had friend, uh, help with, the, with this presentation from a, an anonymous person who has written extensively in Uncle Narly's blog and uh, he's been very helpful to me on this, but I take full responsibility for any errors, and uh, I, I just want to acknowledge that. So I'm going to begin by just posing some questions. So um, my questions here, uh, and I'm not going to go through all these questions now because I'm going to come back to them, but first question is, is Muskrat Falls self-supporting? It's a key question, is it, if it's self-supporting, because if it isn't self-supporting, then it means that somehow we've got to find another way to support it. We have to find money from other sources. The question number two, will Muskrat Falls generate dividends or profits or profits for the people of Newfoundland and Labrador? I'm going to come back to that, as well as the other questions that I've posed here. Very quickly, moving to the next slide, uh, financing of the project. It's a, the financing of this project is based upon $7.9 billion loan guarantee from the federal government, and that's coming in at about 3.5%. Uh, that's quite a good uh, attractive interest rate. But even then, you have to realize that the money we're paying out uh, to the uh, bondholders is more than the money we would have been paying out in oil. That's an interesting observation here. So we were going to avoid uh, paying the oil barons in the Middle East for, the, for their oil. We we're going to be independent. But now we're paying the money, more money, to Wall Street. Money's going to Wall Street. Instead of, so what would you prefer? Would you rather give it to the robber baron, barons in the Middle East or the robber barons in Wall Street? Take, take your pick. Only problem is, what I don't like about this is we're not paying more. We're not sending out more money. Uh, the essence of all this thing is a power purchase agreement between the government, between the uh, two, two aspects of uh, 
of, of a crown corporation. The parent company is Nelcor, and the subsidiary, a wholly owned subsidiary, is Newfoundland Labrador Power. They have an agreement between themselves, which is intended to bind us in some way. And many people have said to me, this can't be. You can't have a power purchase agreement that imposes obligations on the people of Newfoundland and Labrador through an agreement between two crown corporations. Well, that's a legal question. I wish somebody would take them to court on that. I, I really think that that needs to be challenged. But I'm not a lawyer. I'm not qualified to deal with it. I'm going to stick with the economics. The, the revenue requirements, I'm going to use that term, revenue requirements. It's a jargon. I wish I couldn't use it. I wish I didn't use it. But that's the language of public utility regulation. And I was a public utility regulator. And I'm, and I'm, I'm a prisoner of my past. I'm, I've got habits I can't break. And uh, so re but what is revenue requirement is cost. Revenue requirement basically means cost. And as Steve said, the cost of this project is going to go from, it's going to go to $800 million a year starting 2021. That's going to be the cost. And that has to be added to the existing $700 million that we're paying to operate the existing uh, electrical power system. So we're stuck with a $1.5 billion, with a B, uh, dollar uh, cost, which is equivalent to what we're spending on elect uh, education, primary, secondary, post-secondary education in Newfoundland and Labrador. The same. So... Just think about that. We're giving, we're placing electricity on a pedestal, which is e equal to the pedestal on which we rightly place education. So anyway, um, next slide, the risks of the project. Most of the discussion we've had at the um, Muskrat Falls Inquiry have been focused on the construction risk and how did this go? The $12.7 billion, how did this happen? And it's incredible. But I'm not gonna focus on that. I'm gonna focus on the revenue side which is a, a part of the business risk, and it re relates to the load growth, it relates to the demand, and it goes back to the load projections. I'm going to move now to the, the next one, which is a historical and forecast uh, energy needs. That's a complex chart, but what it basically says is that we're going to grow. The, the forecast shows that we're going to continue to require a huge amount of electricity, and if you look at this by uh, 2039, 2040, we're going to be up at over 10,000 gigawatt hours. Now, you don't really need to know what the gigawatt hour is. It's 10,000 units of energy, okay? We're going to get there by, 19, by 2039. And, and then and now, current rates, I'm going to come in a moment to show you that the rates that, the, they're not the rates, the growth that uh, Nelcor is now projecting is considerably less than that. In their uh, presentation to the PUB, load growth revised, next one, uh, Gary, uh, Nalco's presentation projected low growth from um, 2010 to 2069 at 0.8% per annum, reaching over 10,000 gigawatt hours by 2039. They did an update. When Stan Marshall came in, they did an update. So now they're projecting 7,600. 7,600. Moving to the next chart, that's what the next chart shows you, is, is we're going to 7,600 by 2039. A dramatic reduction in load, but still not far enough. If you read, if you read the footnote to the table, the footnote to the table tells you that, that those projections are based on the assumption that the rates are going to go to 18 cents per kilowatt hour, not 23 cents. So in other words, if, and if, you, if you actually factored in the load growth, if you factored in the rate, the full rate of 23 cents, which is the, now the all-up cost of Muscat Falls, the, the demand would collapse even further, and that's where I'm that's where I'm heading in my discussion here. So, next chart is cost of Muskrat Falls power, and that comes out of the next table, the next uh, chart that I'm going to show you. But I the the point is that if all the power from Muskrat Falls was used, all the power if we could use it all, all 4,900 gigawatt hours, the cost would be 17.42 cents. 17.42 cents. Well, that's pretty bad, but we're paying 12 cents kilowatt hour now. That's, that's a hell of a lot because you've got to add Newfoundland Power's uh, uh, markup on top of that. But if you don't use all the power, you know what? That seven, you, the, the cost per unit of Muskrat Falls power doubles. If you only use one-fifth of it, which is what we're now projecting, guess what? The, the, the cost per unit, it quintuples. It quintuples. It goes so it goes to 87 cents per kilowatt hour. And th so what Nalcor does is blend that with existing power cost, and that's how we get the 23 cents. It's an average. It's an average, and it's helped. It's boosted by beta spare, because beta spare is basically, basically paid off. doesn't cost us anything. 
The next uh, chart here basically is, the, is, a, is a pie chart. I'm only going to just use that to show you that the unit cost projections, and the one on the left, the pie on the left basically adds up to 17.42 cents, and that's where I got the number in, in 2017. Uh, and I got that number from Stan Marshall, and it shows the 17.42 cents. And that's broken down between different components, including the, the transmission line, the generation site, and the um, what they call Labrador transmission assets, which is, which is the line from Churchill Falls to Muskrat Falls. The, the pie on the right shows you what the components are, and that's, I'm going to come back to that, because uh, the, 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 um, the, the biggest chunk there, the biggest chunk, is uh, interest. It's it's uh, it's 5.75 cents. It's the blue. It's the the, the light blue, is uh, on the right side. You probably in the back can't see this, but it's the biggest chunk is is interest, and then the next biggest chunk is depreciation. And after that, it's uh, you're you're dealing with return on equity. So those are the key those are the key components here: depreciation, interest, operating, and operations, operations, maintenance, expense. I won't, I won't go through those in great detail because I'm heading up to uh, another chart now shortly. But the, um, one of the things that NALCOR has done in, is, is essentially to, um, to defer certain expenditures. Uh, and this is common. And I look at what happens all across Canada, in Manitoba, in British Columbia, and elsewhere. They'll take chunks of expenditure and put them off into the future in order to make the day look good. And I don't know if you, most of you in this room are too young to remember the comic, uh, Wimpy. And Wimpy used to say, I will gladly give you two hamburgers tomorrow for one hamburger today. So that was all about deferring the costs into the future, okay? Because Wimpy wanted his hamburger today. He didn't really care about tomorrow. And so what we're doing is where there's certain expenditures, certain costs, and the costs in particular that are focused on are the rate of return, the profit as it will, as, it, as you might consider it, that we get, because we're investing $4 billion, we, the people of Newfoundland and Labrador, we are the shareholders, and you know what? We are at the tail end. We're the tail end of the dog, and, and we can't wag the dog. Uh, this is one of those sad situations where the, we're the tail, and we're not wagging the dog here, because but we have no, we're at the bottom, and I'll show you that in a, in a minute, what I mean by that. We're at the bottom, because we're the last ones to get paid. And um, so, but the deferral, what they do is they essentially defer so much in, the, in cost that the costs actually increase over time because of the fact we're deferring costs today. And uh, that's why revenue requirements increase over the next 50 years from $800 million today to, to, uh, to, uh, to 2.6 billion. And I'm gonna move two, sh two slides ahead. Now, uh, this, this big slide here, and I'm afraid you're not gonna be able to see that very well, but. What this, it tells a story. This, this slide tells a story. And basically what, is, what the story is, is the, uh, the, the, the bottom, the bottom of the, um, if you see the, the solid line, uh, the black line at the bottom, that's how much money I've, I've calculated with help uh, as to how much money we're going to generate. That's revenue. That's the revenue we're going to offset. So it starts at about $100 million a year, and that's based on certain elasticity assumptions. Dr. Fien has done a lot of work on elasticity. He's published a paper at the Public Utilities Board. And so we now have a better understanding of elasticity. I'm not going to get into that because it'll sidetrack me. But based upon reasonable assumptions on elasticity, the demand, it shows that we're not going to come anywhere close to recovering the full revenue. So we got re that's the revenue from rates. That's, where this, that's what's supposed to pay for this project. And then you move up. The next, the next thing is fuel savings, OK? So your fuel savings. And, was, and I'm assuming about $150 million in fuel savings is what we're going to save. So that's the next line that goes up there. It's the dotted, the dotted line shows the, um, the, 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 the maximum fuel savings, savings. And where else are we going to get money? Well, we're going to get money by selling power into the mainland of Canada and into the United States. And NALCOR's projections, NALCOR's projections are that we're going to get $56 million in the first year. Doesn't, and it, we, I've increased that by the rate of inflation, 2% a year. So, uh, and then, so when you look at that top line there, export sales, that's the, that big, so we've added up the revenue, the export sales, the fuel savings. We got a, still got a big chunk of cost not covered. That's not covered. And if uh, I'm going to ask uh, Kerry to go to the next slide quickly and then come back to this one. 
This is the loss. These, these are the net muskrat falls losses beginning at 500 million bucks a year, beginning at 500 million, million dollars a year and continuing into the future. A huge chunk of cost. Now go back to that previous uh, table and uh, the previous chart, that one there. Thanks, Kerry. Uh, so this one basically shows that the, um, the cost will go from 800 million to $2.6 billion in, in 50 years. But along the way, there's some big, big increases built into this, okay? So then, I'm going to finish up now quickly, but I'm going to make some conclusions from, the, from this. Conclusions that flow from this analysis and some, some observations. And um, first observation I'm going to make here is that uh, demand increases are necessary to recover costs. In other words, if you don't have the load, you're not going to recover costs. And the, we projected that the load, the demand, is uh, is not growing as it was anticipated to grow. It can't, in the face of demographic projections, which which show the province's population declining, and in the face of price increases, how can you expect to see demand increasing? Now, when I talk about demand, I'm talking about the, essentially the revenues. I'm talking about, and the revenue is a product of what we actually consume in electrical power, measured in kilowatt hours or gigawatt hours, doesn't matter. It's a product of that multiplied by the rate. And so when you multiply by the rate, and if the rate is high, and if the, the, then, and the quantity is going to be low, then the revenues are going to be low. You can have a high price, but, but if the uh, quantities are uh, consumed are low, then you're going to end up with, with very little revenue. And so the big concern I have is we're not going to have the revenue. And uh, so uh, with reasonable elasticity estimates uh, combined with declining population estimates, uh, population revenues, um, our revenues are not going to exceed $100 million a year. That's what I've assumed. Export revenues would add $50 million. Oil savings, $150 million. And all of this transla translates into a loss of $500 million arising in nominal dollars. So we can move on now, uh, Kerry, to uh, we'll move past that one and we'll pass to the next one. Thank you. Um, so the incapacity to recover costs is for, is for me the big problem of Muskrat Falls. It can't pay for itself. And this is a problem that should have been recognized prior to sanction because even back in the old cost, before the cost didn't escalate way up to $12.7 billion, they were going to go, they were going to, go to 6.2 and then to 7.4. But even back in those days, we were facing a 50 to 60% increase in rates. So the elasticity impact was there all along. And we never talked about it. It was buried. We had our heads in the sand. So it's a problem that should have been recognized, and it's been exacerbated. The problem's gotten worse. Moving to the next one, number three, payment of interest on debt is the first claim on revenues after O&M. You've you got to pay your debt. You've got to pay your debt. That's a fundamental principle. And, and uh, uh, so first, the first claim is, is O&M. After that comes your debt. O&M is basically paying, paying the workers who are working on Muskrat Falls. And so there's a big O&M cost. Operation, operation and maintenance is what I'm talking about. Then comes debt. And then the dividends or profits, profits come right at the bottom at the end. I mean, if you have an enterprise that's not profitable, then the shareholders are going to bear that cost. And then what happens then is the province is compelled to write off its equity and to forego dividends. So I'm going to come back now to my next question, which is the answer to my questions. What the conclusion of this presentation is, is um, question one, is Muskrat Falls self-supporting? No. Rates will not support costs. We're looking at a deficit of five, at least $500 million a year. Question number two, will Muskrat Falls generate dividends, uh, profits, profits for the government of Newfoundland and Labrador? The answer is no. The answer is no because of the cost, the revenues will barely cover the cost of operations and maintenance and make a small contribution to the, uh, to the interest on the debt. But most of the interest on the debt will not be covered. Question number three, will the financial burden decline over time, as did the burden of Bay to Spare? One of the things that Nelco kept telling us was, in the long run, this is going to be great. In the long run, this is going to be great. Now, to quote a great economist uh, of the 20th century, John Maynard Keynes, John Maynard Keynes said, in the long run, we're all going to be dead. So, you know, in the long run, we're all going to be dead. Well, so uh, that sort of fixes your mind on the future, like what's going to happen in the immediate future when I'm still around, maybe when my kids are still around. And, uh, but but the, the problem, okay, so what you're faced with here is not the beta spare situation because beta spare 
was financed in a different way. Basically, it was written off early. What we're talking about is writing off this project over a long period of time because that was the only way to pretend that this made any sense, was to write this off over 50 years. And you know what's going to happen? Is the cost per kilowatt hour of Muskrat Falls power remains the same. 2021, it's at a certain level. And then they're going to escalate that in real terms so that your great-grandchildren in 2069 will be paying the same rate, the same unit cost per kilowatt hour. They're going to be, that's not true with Muskrat, with Beta Spare. With Beta Spare, we're paying probably a fraction of a cent. It's measured in mills, what we're paying today. What our great-grandchildren are going to be paying in 2069 will be measured in, in cents, and it's probably going to be a number like more like 50 cents per kilowatt hour. So will the financial burden over time? No, the burden will rise. The burden will rise. This is a gift that keeps on taking. Will rates be affordable? Of course not. Of course not. No, nobody's looked at this. This is the, in all of the documents that I've looked at, and I've looked at thousands of documents, and I, w and I have to confess, confess, I haven't read all the documents, but I've read a hell of a lot of them, and I have seen no discussion of affordability. Can people afford to pay for Muscat Falls Power? And energy, we need to have a big conversation about energy poverty, energy poverty, because we're going to see a lot of energy poverty. Question number five, will further federal support be necessary? Well, I can tell you, the federal government is into this up to their neck to the tune of $7.9 billion. And if, this, if we can't pay the, make the payments, they're going to be there. The feds are going to be there. Anybody that tells you federal government is not going to be at the table, they're dreaming in technicolor. The feds are going to be at the table, and we're going to be going to them on bended knee saying, can you rescue us? And you know what they're going to say? There will be a cost. My, my, and and, and, I, and what, so that comes to my final comment, which is, yes, the federal government will come to the rescue, but they will extract a pound of flesh they will extract a pound of flesh. So go back to the Merchant of Venice. I think that's where that pound of, the pound of flesh originated. There will be a large pound of flesh extracted from us. And you know what that's going to be? That's going to be a cost in terms of our health care services, our education services, and what we depend upon every day. Because in order for us to be able to pay the cost of Muscat Falls, we're going to have to show that we are bleeding, that we have cut to the bone, and the federal government will come to the rescue uh, and you know the worst case is the wor worst case is we default and the federal government takes over our province, and as it ha as the federal government in the United States has done with Puerto Rico, and uh, if, we were, if a responsible Newfoundland and Labrador, if we are responsible citizens, we will not go the Puerto Rico route. We will we will find a way. We will not relinquish our sovereignty as we did in 1934. We'll find a way to make this to make those cuts by its responsible fiscal policy and also tightening our belt. And uh, it's, it's not going to be nice. It's not going to be pleasant. And that's why I'm not going to write the book, uh, because it's not, I can't see the happy ending. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. That was incredible. Uh, we are taking questions from the audience. Um, so uh, myself and Lisa are going to come around when I fix this slide. Um, okay. Oh, perfect. You're already on it. Oh, now it's on. Um, so my question is for uh, Mr. Vardy. Um, when you say that the, um, uh, the loan guarantee requires that uh, is me, if you're looking, <laughs> um, that the loan guarantee requires that the ratepayers pay. Um, and Dwight Ball says, oh, no, the ratepayers are not going to pay. Um, what does he have to do in order to make that a possibility? Does he have to renegotiate the loan guarantee? Does he have to pass legislation? Excellent question. Excellent question. And the, the, the power purchase agreement is a, uh, an irrevocable take or pay contract uh, between these two crown corporations. And you know something, it can't happen. It can't, this is like, uh, it's, it's like making a, a river run uphill. It, it, the power purchase agreement is mission impossible. So what we have to do is we have to go back to the drawing board. The business plan on which this whole thing was predicated uh, is just impossible. It's not a, it's not a viable business plan. Dwight Ball has to go back to the drawing board and renegotiate this. He's got to have a different deal. He's got to involve more federal assistance, probably in the form of equity. 
and uh, that's why I was so disappointed when he made those statements at the uh, beginning of the by-election. He made these statements about we're going to, we're going to, when the ratepayer is not going to have to pay. Well, I assume that what he meant by that is he's finally realized that the, he somebody explained to him about elasticity, and that he finally realized that you got to find a different way to finance this project. But then it became clear he didn't have a plan. He did not have a plan, and so it's very disappointing. And so a lot of people said, "Aren't you happy?" that this has now been referred to the Public Utilities Board. Not in 2018. This should have been re referred to the Public Utilities Board back in 2015, in December 2015, when the government took over. But instead of that, they kept on building this project. They kept on building the project in spite of the fact we didn't have a way to pay for it. And we, to this day, do not have a way to pay for this project. In my opinion, this whole project should have been stopped until we figured out how we're going to pay for it. Because to this day, we do not have a plan. And that's, I think, a, a terrible situation. There's a lot of blame here. There's blame for the previous administration of getting, in, getting us into this. There's blame for the current administration because they've been in power now for almost three years, come December, and this is September. In another uh, uh, three months, they would have been in power for three, for three years. What have they done other than extend the loan guarantee? They've got more money from the federal government. But they have not demonstrated to the federal government or to the people of Newfoundland and Labrador how this is going to be paid for and how it's going to impact on our social programs. Steve, did you want to say something there? Something very helpful that Dave actually alerted me to is that, as I understand the situation now, is that Nalcor, an unregulated utility corporation, sets the price that it sells electricity for to NL Hydro, which is regulated. So we have control over NL Hydro rates, but we don't have control over the bulk price of electricity sold to Newfoundland Hydro, and so it has to do with the regulation of that price into regulated utility. Is that right? If that's too complicated to unpack, but you had told me that, and that, to me that, that seemed so clear in terms of the problem of regulation and deregulation and how it would go back into what would need to be regulated in what way. I think Dr. Fien should, should respond to this question as well, but, but the... Um, yeah, yes, uh, and, and what the problem, the problem is here is that Newfoundland Power, Newfoundland, Newfoundland Labrador Hydro goes to the Public Utilities Board and what they say is we have a bill, it's called Purchase Power, we have a bill for Purchase Power from an Alcor, and, uh, and, uh, and then the PUB will say, oh, we're going to ask if that's prudent, are those costs prudent, because we have, a, we have an obligation to defend the principle of least cost power. And we will ask that question, but then they're not, they cannot ask that question. They have to accept the bill. The reason, the, the real sad story here is that the, the Public Utilities Board is left with these costs. They cannot challenge those costs for prudence. I think we're going to, or do you want to answer? Okay. Well, there's, this one was second, and then we'll do that one. And unfortunately, we're, we're running close to time, so... A uh, wonderful panel, uh, raised a lot of critical insights, I'll keep it short. Uh, much of the focus is on where power is located, where it exists, the myths that versus the realities. Where power should be located needs to be a, a critical piece, I think, now. We have, as you suggest, institutionalized chaos. The chaos continues, and you know, I, I love that kind of uh, reference in terms of the, uh, the message coming from Ball. Uh, that we need to focus on the issues, we need to focus on the problems. Uh, the challenge or problem is that we're not doing it. Um, again, many of us who have been critical of Muskrat Falls have really kind of been outliers. Um, so, I, so I guess my, my, my question is how can we now put pressure, change, challenge the system of decision making because it is powerful, the powerful myths which are associated with it, but I'm not seeing any change. I think the chaos continues. Thank you, Steve. Um, we have a question here. Okay. Um, I guess it's for both Steve and Jim. Maybe others can comment too. There were a number of short phrases that really piqued my mind. So I'd like to know whether these two would offer useful analysis frameworks. There's some limitations. The players are different, but there were some key words that really caught: monopoly, well beyond need, lack of accountability, threats to our own security, pathological life of its own. Well, that hit me right away, the military-industrial complex. Um, it's dated, and I said the players are different. We don't have nuclear annihilation, but there is major threats to security in other ways. 
So that's one framework. I'm just curious how useful that would be. The other one um, was debt financed, foreign ownership, sovereignty threatened and being reorganized, lack of any, of any requirement to serve the public good. And I was thinking about the third world debt crisis and the IMF. And again, to me, this seems to some pretty good strong analogies. So I'm curious for, yeah, are those useful? What are the limitations? Okay. Uh, well, there's there's a lot of things in what you mentioned. Uh, I mean, are these useful analogies and so on? I think so. To, just the last thing that you mentioned, IMF debt scenarios, that kind of thing. I mean, we are in a kind of scenario like that now, that Greece or Spain or many of the other countries that have been subjected to debt financing and now find themselves unable to pay unsustainable loans enter into. And so we've seen like the typical scenario over the last 25, 30 years when this happens to countries is that as someone mentioned along the way here, that there will be much, you know, beating of the heart about austerity measures. Are you poor enough? Have you bled enough before there was any relief and so on? I think the best case scenario is if we could cut past the austerity and get to the loan relief immediately. It would be a useful thing to recognize that this is an unsustainable loan, like many other kinds of unsustainable loans that were signed up for the public without much public involvement in the organization of that loan, that the loan guarantee was increased, we should know, I mean, everybody does know, I guess, at the end of December 2016 when it was known that there was new science about methylmercury, that this was an enormous problem that would require, now they're saying, $700 million to mitigate it. They knew that there was problems with the Staldi being unable to operate in cold climates, which seems, but we don't know because we don't know the internal dealings of the Staldi, but Terry Roberts at the CBC tracked down the numbers and showed that in Astaldi's report, then it seems to be reporting $700, 700 million more. So that was increased at the time we knew there were other public obligations. The federal government was involved in that. It has tied us into a loan that undermines our energy, financial, and physical security. And so there is a question of our you know, responsibility for that. Uh, these loans are tied to very specific and powerful mechanisms that make people pay under circumstances in which they cannot. So. I don't know if that responds to it, but it's the same kind of scenario. Yeah, it's important to see that the, the local crisis that's visited upon us is part of much glo larger global mechanisms that are being used all over the world. And that's why it's important, too, to see the comprehensibility of it. If we see that this is just some bizarre, exceptional circumstance that happened in Newfoundland, usually these things work out, etc., or that, that this is a mega project and it's a logic going around the world and everybody has to be subjected to it for some reason, you need to see the comprehensible kernel of it. It was specifically organized in order to create conditions of repayment, even if the thing was not serving the public good and it was decoupled from any kind of mechanism that would make it serve the public good. So I think those are really the things that to be addressed. I'm sorry, we just have time for one more question right here. And then you can speak with these people outside. There's going to be some goodies. Oh, did you narrate? Please do. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'll, uh, and I'll be quick because I know that we're running out of time. But I just wait. So, <laughs> um, but I just kind of like to speak to the to the parallel drawn between. Um, the structural adjustment programs in what we call the third world. And I mean, I'm in development studies, so I, I look at this a lot. Um, and I think that it's really interesting that we would even think about drawing that, that comparison and the way that we draw it, right? And the way that we would think about that is us as a third world country, as we're the ones who, who are suffering on the part, at the hands of kind of this bigger nebulous global capitalist force. Um, but I would just like to kind of backtrack a little bit and just kind of think that we're already, we're already kind of, there are levels, right, of different kinds of oppression that kind of layer on top of each other. And while we're, we're kind of thinking about the future when the Newfoundland public is going to be subjected to all this, this is all happening while we're literally like poisoning people in Labrador. So that, that, that kind of very real, that very real, those things can happen at the same time. Um, and I think that, kind, that it's a really problematic Think, like trope that we keep using in Newfoundland that we're the ones that are put down while at the same time we're kind of continuously putting down people in other parts of Labrador and in other parts of our province. Um, and there's a lot of really interesting discourse, especially in the academy, about the way that white people like to think that we're, that we're safe, that, we, that the, 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 the terrible things are still going to come and that it hasn't happened yet when actually 
it's already happening in other parts of our province. So it's just kind of, it's interesting that we always put ourselves as the ones who are being kind of oppressed when actually we're already doing that. And these things can happen at the same time. Yeah. Uh, uh, Neria's last comment actually anticipated what I was going to raise. Uh, she, she referenced structural adjustment. Uh, for those who may not recall, this is a, 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 a uh, the International Monetary Fund starting, I guess, uh, in the 70s, started bailing out third world countries on the condition that they radically surrender their management of their own fiscal situations to IMF regulators who would be put in place in those gover governments and it often worked to the detriment of social justice and so on, as well as to the detriment of corruption and waste. But uh, the, the, my question, if anybody would like to venture there, uh, David referenced the, the idea of a pound of flesh, which is the obvious place we're going to turn. If, if, we, if the federal government has to come in and underwrite this thing, and I presume that that is why the, the bondholders still give uh, the bond rating agencies still give some kind of a, a bottom feeding uh, qualification to the to the Newfoundland uh, 30 and 60 day bonds is that they know that ultimately they will be backed by the federal government. I presume that the, this would mean some sort of massive transfer, two billion a year, one billion a year or something from the federal government to Newfoundland in exchange for something. And uh, David suggests that Newfoundland would not, unlike uh, 1934, give up its sovereignty. It would have to give up some degree of sovereignty, it seems to me. I think there would be some kind of rigid control, have to be, over, over the uh, management of the uh, Newfoundland uh, uh, government. I just wonder if there would be any comment on that. Uh, we're starting to think about the unthinkable, but everybody is whispering about it. Would you like for me to start that? Um, okay, I, I, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about, and I won't go there, I'll just mention this, but there's, there's, there's discussions going on about whether, whether we should be extending the Upper Churchill contract, whether we should be sacrificing our legacy assets whether we should be dealing with the Atlantic Accord. If we are under pressure by the federal government, uh, then they're gonna, there's going to be questions about the, the Atlantic Accord, which gives, transfers a lot of wealth to us. There's going to be issues about uh, if, we're, if we've got our hand out looking for money, uh, people are going to be suggesting we uh, do a deal with Quebec on the Upper Churchill. Uh, but putting that all to a side, because those are big questions that, that I it would take a lot of time to discuss, but I just on the question of the federal government coming uh, to help us out, I think that we would need to um, make changes with our current account deficit at a minimum if we're going to, we're going to have to cut back the size of government in Newfoundland and Labrador and demonstrate that we are really prepared to tighten our belt if we're going to get any f additional federal help. But any federal help we get is likely to be very, um, very, um, not very um, transparent, because I think that if there was any kind of a, a, a bailout uh, associated with Muskrat Falls, then we would, that would create a lot of problems for Ontario and other larger provinces. So I think that um, the, the federal government may come in here and help us out in some ways. There might be some changes in the equalization formula. There may be a number of subtle ways they can help us fiscally. I don't really think they're going to come in uh, and take on the Muskrat Falls issue frontally. They may take it on to the back door because we are so small. We are uh, so, such a small part of Canada, and there's other parts of Canada that will be, cl be clamoring for the same thing because there's no other province that got this loan guarantee. Site C doesn't have a loan guarantee. Manitoba doesn't have the loan guarantee. So we got this loan guarantee, and the federal government is saying to us, we've done as much as we can go. We've gone as far as we can go. I think that um, uh, we're going to, it's not going to be easy, but we're going to first have to demonstrate our ability to manage our affairs and uh, um, before the federal government will come to the table. And, but I do really think that we should be trying to avoid, uh, we should be trying to avoid relinquishing our sovereignty. And that means that we have to act now. We should not, we should not be in a situation where we are in a reactive mode. We, we, should, we should take advanced no, uh, action 
to deal with these issues rather than being forced because nobody can predict when we will go to the bond market and we can't raise bonds and we can't pay the salaries of public servants and we can't pay this, the pensions of pensioners. But two years ago, I remember sitting in the, with the Minister of Finance and was told that we put out a bond issue, a long-term bond issue, you know, there were no takers and they had to go and with chain, withdraw the bond issue and they had to put, put out, they had to borrow in the short-term market. So it's not inconceivable. One day we wake up some morning out of the blue and the government of Newfoundland and Labrador cannot borrow money in the long-term bond market and then it has to scramble in order to meet its payments. So it's like, it's like the North Spur in many respects. It won't come slowly. In my opinion, if the North Spur collapses, it will collapse quickly. If our financial position uh, collapses, it's going to collapse quickly. I don't, we have to get ahead of that. That's, that's basically all I have to say. Thank you, everyone. Thank, let's thank this panel. Please come out and enjoy some treats. We're back here at 11.20. Um, and uh, thank you so much for being here.